Hey, I don't know why I'm telling him, like he does it without me, huh? You, you know, you're a dad, you gotta direct. Let me know when we good. We're live. Move that down so I can see it. Hmm? I can't hear you. Oh, God. All right, I want to welcome everybody here today. Thank you so much for being here. Give yourselves a hand for just coming out today, the community coming out. You know, we've seen a lot of stuff happen here in our city, and it is so, uh, it just warms my heart so much to see people come out um, that are concerned, that want to say, how do we not stop the violence, but how do we prevent it from happening to begin with? We've seen a lot of, of things happen, and we've got, we've got some, uh, some guests that are here to speak, and we're going to talk about some solutions today and what we're all actually going to do um, to be able to handle the problem and situation. So before uh, we get into all of those things, we've got some special guests that I definitely want to have come up and, and speak a little bit to, uh, to the situation, give you a little background on themselves as well. Um, for those that don't know, if you're watching live, we're here in Arlington. In Texas. Uh, we are famous for a few things. Uh, number one, where the Cowboys play. I don't know if we got any Cowboys fans in the house. Uh huh, okay. We got a few uh, Cowboys lovers and one or two haters. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good in loving football. Um, but but uh, we're few, uh, right here between Dallas and Fort Worth, uh, for those that don't know exactly where we are located. Um, it is a city that is probably the largest uh, small city that you'll ever be in, um, with just over 400,000 people. So a lot of times when people hear Arlington, they don't think Arlington, Texas. They think Arlington, Virginia. Um, but uh, I'm here to tell you that uh, we're so much better than Arlington, Virginia, for a lot of reasons. Uh, wouldn't you guys agree? Oh, yeah. yeah, we got a couple of them. We've got some, not, not knocking Virginia, I'm sure y'all are great, but we love Arlington, Texas uh, just so much. So we've got some people here today. We definitely want to be able to hear from them, and we've got some things that we're bringing here to the city uh, for you to listen to, for you to get involved in, and we're going to show you exactly how to do it. Um, a lot of people don't realize there, there's, there are people that are in your area that are specifically tasked with keeping your area safe. Uh, some of them you see all the time. Some of them you might not see as much, but let me tell you, they are tasked with making sure that you can live your everyday life and, uh, and not have to live it in terror and uh, are able to help get certain types of, of mentalities uh, away from the general population. And so one of those gentlemen, several of those gentlemen are here today. Uh, one of those gentlemen is a friend of mine. He is the constable uh, right here in Arlington and uh, handling the, I guess it would be considered the, the, the east to west and north portion of our precinct. Would that be about right? All right. Um, the, everyone knows him as, as Constable McGinney, but I know him as Pastor McGinney. If you can put your hands together. Pastor, if you can just come and say a few things uh, from your perspective, I appreciate it. Well, I want to say hello to everyone, and it's an honor and a privilege to be here today. Uh, be with my good friend, um, Pastor Washington. A lot of my co-laborers here as well, uh, Chief Police here in Arlington, Texas, uh, Constable uh, Mike Campbell, uh, Precinct 8, uh, a couple of my deputies as well uh, from Precinct 2, as long as, uh, as well as other officers from Arlington PD. I'm Robert J. McGinty. I'm the Constable here at Precinct 2 here in Arlington, Texas. I've been in law enforcement over 30 plus years, um, beginning with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, as well as Sheriff Department in um, Civil Warrants, Criminal Warrants, um, Investigation, and other departments as well. Um, when it comes down to preventing the violence, um, I think that this is the correct approach in dealing with violence in all of our communities uh, in preventing the, uh, preventing the violence. I think that we need to go back to the source, uh, the cause of the issue, and not just dress address the uh, symptoms uh, of the issue. I think we need to get back to the, the cause and what is causing the violence in our community, even as it relates to the shooting in uh, Mansfield PD, uh, Mansfield ISD, as well as uh, other things uh, that are going on in our community. I think from a law enforcement 
law enforcement perspective, it takes all of us working together, doing our part, and not just in serving the civil papers, not just in patrolling our communities, but being actively involved and engaged in every aspect of our communities. I believe that police officers are not here to um, address, just to address their, uh, the symptoms. I think that we can do more in when we start addressing uh, our communities, um, the families engaged in our community, get to know our, our communities, get to know our neighbors, um, as well as uh, Pastor Washington have uh, many other things he involved with, and not just not behind a pulpit, but he is actively involved, engaged with the youth, uh, where there's an absent, where there's a void of uh, parental guidance. I think that we can help support uh, other community programs. Uh, I've been involved with a program called CDF Freedom School for about 10 years, partnered together with Morningside Children Partnership, and this is addressing our children right where they are. And uh, before, uh, as, the, as they say many years ago, he's trying to stop that uh, pipeline uh, from the cradle to prison. And so uh, we have to address people right where they are, our youth right where they are, uh, whether the board of um, fathers or the board of, of families. And that's when uh, these other elements come in and they pick up our children and they become their surrogate families. And so I believe there's a as a law enforcement officer, I can do more, and we can all do more, and not in just uh, patrolling our neighborhoods because we need good, qualified, and uh, police officers that are professional. Uh, but I think that uh, as a law enforcement officer, I can do more and, and do better uh, about addressing our community needs. I think it comes with communication, uh, collaboration uh, with other agencies, and we've been talking about that before the program began, and, I, and it's good to know that we have a, a good um, open door communication with all of the police agencies within my precinct and other precincts as well. And when something happens, we all respond, and we respond, and, uh, and we can all work together to address that issue. Once again, I want to thank uh, Dwayne Washington for invite, inviting me here, and as Precinct 2, we're always open to assist APD, DWG, Pantigo, uh, uh, Arlington ISD, uh, UTA PD, as well as Grand Prairie PD. I think I, that covers every, all the PDs within <laughs> Precinct 2. A lot of PDs. Yeah, a lot of PDs. But we're all here, and we all, we all know that we all need each other. Uh, we all uh, are open to a, a partner and assist uh, in, in any areas that we can. And I think we need to be proactive, not just reactive. And I think that's when we can really uh, make a change. Once again, we're open uh, for uh, assistance in any way possible. I'm just honored to be here uh, on part of this program in preventing the violence. And I think that's where we need to start and look in ways that we can prevent these things from happening. And uh, I, I want to keep going on, but uh, there's many things we can do. Once again, thank you all for having me here today, Mr. Washington. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate that. And once again, we're, uh, if, if you're watching live, make sure to share this um, because we want to make sure that we answer some questions that you have, no matter where you, where you are. Um, we're going to be uh, giving you information on this program that we have coming out. And so stick around. Don't, don't go anywhere. Uh, and with that being said, there's another special guest in the house um, that is, you know, I'm, I'm glad to call him my new friend. Uh, he's new here to uh, to Arlington, but not new to what he does. Uh, he comes to us from the East Coast, uh, Baltimore County, right? Um, and we're, uh, we're glad to have him here in Arlington. I'm glad they went all the way up there and got you. It's a lot warmer here. Um, I want you to put your hands together for our Chief of Police right here in Arlington, Texas, Mr. Chief Jones. Well, first, uh, I just want to say thank you for having me here today, and I just want to thank Pastor Washington for, for the invitation. Um, you know, when you start thinking about or looking at, you know, preventing violence here in the city, uh, the things you have to think about is the collaboration piece that um, McGinty talked about. Uh, it has to be a collaboration between the community, uh, the business, uh, law enforcement. Um, that's the way I look at it. And, and if you actually look at it, from that perspective. You're bringing a lot of key people uh, who can actually solve a lot of this violence to the table. Um, you want to look at it from a long-term long approach. 
it's not a band-aid it's not something that we should probably look at or solving uh, immediately I know it's going to be a long term um, and how we are addressing those issues but I think that we just have to have the right people uh, at the table um, I can tell you I, I've come from Baltimore County and I've been here for nine months um, and one of the things that I, I talk about and, and, and it goes in hand in hand when you start talking about um, violence prevention um, it's also goes about it goes to the fact of having your officers um, really engage the community I think that's where it starts um, so what, what I've been talking about since I've been here is about transparency um, I think that we have to be transparent in how we are carrying out our business every day um, I think we have to make sure that uh, we are having open and honest dialogue with our communities because I think when you can actually start having open and honest dialogue that's when you start getting to the heart of the matter um, then the second thing that I tell my officers that I told my officers when I've been since I've been here is that we have to make sure that we are respecting our community uh, and making sure that we are treating them with dignity in each and every contact we have um, and and that goes a long way because here it is and what I always say is sometimes good people do make bad decisions and if we treat everyone like criminals then all we're doing is making a cycle of criminal uh, of criminals so I think we just have to look at it from that approach uh, the other thing I always talk about is engaging our community um, I expect the officers to get out of their cars um, to have uh, open and honest dialogue to interact with our kids interact with our citizens I, I think that not only do they want it um, but they actually deserve it um, they want to know their officers they want to know the officers that are patrolling their their, uh, their communities and they want to know them by first name and I think when you can have that kind of conversation dialogue with the citizens that's when you start um, really uh, getting to the heart of the matter uh, of what's going on within the communities because I can tell you the citizens know exactly what is occurring in their community if we're not getting out and we're not engaging them um, how are we really going to solve the problem and it can't just be the police uh, the la the other thing that I always talk about is accountability uh, we actually have to make sure that we are accountable to our community um, and we actually have to make sure uh, that our community holds us accountable to how we are carrying out our job how we do things every single day and I think if we're going to look at uh, uh, preventing violence here in Arlington we actually make sure that we are holding ourselves in, in the community holding us accountable uh, the other thing I'm talking about is a training um, it, it's about a training for our officers making sure that we're getting the proper training to be able to engage our community you know so oftentimes we tell everybody to go out and do community policing we tell them to go out and interact with the community but unfortunately sometimes uh, they don't know exactly what that looks like um, so I think we actually have to make sure that we're really truly uh, training them on every level so that we can have these dialogues in this conversation so what I'm going to say here is I'm going to leave it here is I just want to say thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, engage with you today um, but I know that uh, if we're going to solve and solve crime and prevent violence here in Arlington uh, we have to do it as a team we have to do it as, as cohesive team because once we're all on the same team there's nothing that we can't solve so thank you you know I think it's so important what chief just said like how do we how do we all come together and make it happen together right um, coming together there's nothing that we can't solve I shared I shared a, uh, a story with chief some uh, some weeks ago uh, when I first moved to Arlington and I was a kid I was about you know 15 16 years old and I lived on the south side of Arlington just south of 20 nice area and evidently a drug dealer had moved into the city or moved into the to the neighborhood and uh, so we had a community meeting on how to be able to solve this problem now I should say that uh, I, I grew up in an area that we uh, uh, so, so quickly call the hood, right? So this was where I grew up. And so I was, not, I was not used to community meetings. Like I had never had one. And so they put a note on my door, said we're going to meet at this house. We're going to talk about it. And I will never forget. So I came into the house and there were two police officers there. And I immediately got concerned and scared. I'm like, oh, it's a trick. They're going to arrest us all. What's going on? And, uh, and so I was, I was uh, a little standoffish. I 
stayed close to the door, you know, kind of gave everybody the side eye. And as I observed the meeting, and the interesting thing is uh, during the meeting, I was listening to how the officers were saying, here is how we can help um, to alleviate the situation. And it was the first time in my entire life um, that I had uh, witnessed such help uh, from from police officers and it it as a young man it changed my mind in a lot of ways because uh, that was not my experience <laughs> until that particular thing so so I appreciate you looking out and want to make sure that we do this cohesively I also want to want to want to acknowledge there's a couple of other people in the the audience that may not come up and speak but uh, we have uh, Constable Campbell is here thank you for coming uh, Harry Ed, uh, our retired state rep right here all the way from Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you for coming in. My friend Laura right here, y'all from, uh, now is, is it, I always mess this up, Urban. Um, so it's just Arlington Urban Media and Entertainment. Arlington Urban Media and Entertainment. Yes. Um, Lauren does a phenomenal job of, of keeping tabs uh, on Arlington, all perspectives, whether they're interviewing mayoral candidates or just keeping their finger and their hand on the pulse. Um, believe it or not, a lot of people knew about the incident um, this past week because of your reporting. And so, wonderful job on that. Um, got our friend Star Telegram here. I know you want to come say anything. You're behind the scenes, but I always want to acknowledge you. Caitlin in the house, I appreciate you. Um, we, we, once again, before we just dive into it, I, I really want you to hear some voices um, that you normally don't get a chance to hear. Um, and so we have, uh, we have a, a couple of police officers that I would like to ask just to come forward, say a few things on the matter. We had a, a great conversation before going live, and so a lot of this information is great for you to have. Uh, Officer Reeves, uh, if you can come up. Y'all can put your hands together. Thank you, Pastor Washington. Uh, yeah, I, I can't say a whole lot uh, more than, than Chief Jones, Councilman McGinty. Uh, I, sometimes I get on a soapbox about uh, when it comes to the, the, what's going on in society, uh, it, and it always seems to be it's a blame game. Every, it, it, we, it's a big blame game. Uh, we, everybody wants to blame schools. Uh, we're going to blame the police. Uh, it's gonna, we're going to, uh, whether it's a racial issue, whether it's, you know, social media, you, you name it. Uh, but what we've really nailed it down to with everything combined, it's, it's a society problem. With the, with the violence that's going on, it's a society problem. And like Chief Jones said, uh, it, it starts with having those conversations. Uh, I've, I, uh, when, when Councilman McGinty was uh, recently elected, he and I had discussions about uh, Black Lives Matter. And, 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 and my, I, my stance on it is we can't be afraid to have those uncomfortable conversations. Now, what those uncomfortable conversations are, it's basically whatever is going on at that given time, whether it's, whether it's school shootings, whether it's something has to do with a police shooting, whatever, whatever the case is, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, you, you got a, a political stance, we get it. But you have to, uh, you have to be able to have that conversation with everyone. And uh, my, my, I've been in law enforcement for 26 years. Uh, I've done quite a bit in law enforcement from you know, administration. I was an assistant chief of my previous uh, department for a period of time. Um, now I've been a, a constable, a deputy constable for two and a half years, a totally different aspect of law enforcement. But it's still, it's all the same. Well, we're still out there in the public. You're still having those conversations. And uh, I've, you know, just had a conversation last night with a young man, and and he wants to know how I feel about the new laws with open carry and this. I, I'm okay with it because law enforcement is for 26 years that I've been in it. We've always been taught you have to treat everybody as if they do have a gun. It doesn't mean that I'm going to draw my weapon and 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 treat somebody with disrespect. Uh, it's it, but it is about uh, again, like Chief Jones said, it, it's about training. And uh, you can't stop training our officers. And, but it's not just training police officers. It's training the public to understand what the officers are being trained on, as well as training the officers on what the aspect of 
uh, of the perception of the public. And uh, I, I feel like I'm probably reiterating a lot of, of what these gentlemen are saying, but uh, I, I, could, I could get on this subject for, uh, for, for a long time. We, we have a lot of discussions about it, um, and I want to give others the opportunity, but uh, I, I just can't reiterate it enough. It's, it's, it's really about uh, conversations. It's really about talking about it. It's getting into the public and just shaking hands and, and telling people how, how I feel. Tell, and, and I want to hear what, you have, what they have to say. And we can't uh, treat everybody as if they're criminals, because they're not, uh, like Chief Jones said. You make one mistake, uh, you know, you, you've got a choice to make if you make that mistake. Are you going to let that define you as a person, or how you're going to react to that mistake define you as a person? There's really not anything in between. You can either be part of the problem or part of the solution. Uh, that's, I've, I've said that so many times in my career to officers, uh, to young men. Uh, I've, you know, I, was, I wasn't a, a great teenager. I think we've all made mistakes as teenagers. Uh, you know, I had run-ins with the police when I was younger. Uh, my, dad, uh, my, my dad retired from Arlington PD, so when I had run-ins with law enforcement, let me tell you, I, I had to deal with it. Uh, my dad was in my face, but I was fortunate enough to have that family unit. And I think that's uh, the other, other issue that we're talking about here today is, is, is making sure that if you don't have a, a, fa a whole family, a family unit, that you, there's places you can go to and there's place, people you can turn to. And law enforcement is one of those places that if you need guidance, you need just, you can't be afraid to come to us and ask us so, some of those uncomfortable questions. Um, again, I, I, like I said, I could go on <laughs> with this for, for, for a while, but uh, it's, I, I, it's very, I'm very passionate about it. I have for a long time. Uh, there's things I've learned that I don't understand when it comes to the perceptions of the black community with us. And it's been an eye-opening experience in the past four or five years. Uh, and I'm, I'm blessed to be able to, have, to see things a little bit differently. Uh, but by the same token, I feel like I, I really want, whether it's the black or the Hispanic community or uh, Asian community, I, it's really passionate to me that they know why I chose this profession and why I do what I do. Uh, I can't speak for every police officer, but uh, it's, it's been a great profession. My, my, like I said, my dad was an officer for 31 years. My grandfather was a state trooper. So it was something that was in my, my family. And, and I'm very fortunate, uh, but things have changed a lot in 26 years, and we have to change with it. Not just law enforcement, but society in general, we have to change with it. And if we don't, it, it's, it's going to get It's going to get tough. But I appreciate having the opportunity. Um, you know, thank you for having me. I'm glad, I'm glad I was able to at least, well, I hope I was able to help and explain a few things, especially on a police officer's point of view. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's interesting that he said something, um, and, and she said the same thing. You know, you have good people to make bad choices. Um, I remember I was working uh, with some youth in prison. And there was one young man that uh, he was in prison for a good reason. You know, he, he robbed a, uh, like a 7-Eleven type store. So that's a good reason for you to end up in prison. And, but if, if you peel back the onion just a little bit and we start looking at, and, and don't get me wrong, here's a young man that says, I am where I'm supposed to be. You know, I committed a crime, I got caught, I'm supposed to be locked up. So this is, this is not, something where this young man is saying, woe is me. Um, but, but let me pull back the onion on the situation. Um, he, at the time, was about 14 years old. And he had noticed a young lady that was on the street that had a baby, a very, very small baby. And it became apparent that she was pretty much living on the street. And you know, he began a conversation with her and come to find out you know, she had been kicked out of the house, her mom kicked her out, and there's a lot of issues with that. And she had no money to feed the baby and all this kind of thing, and he didn't have any money. And so he figured, well, you know, people with money go to the 7-Eleven and they deposit money there. <laughs> I should go get that money from them. Uh, of course, not a good idea, and because he wasn't uh, 
good at it, you know, <laughs> he went down his first time. And, you know, he ended, when young man, it happens about 14 years old, I think he ended up with like six or seven years in prison, something like that. And, and so here he is, he's in prison as a young man, I think he was about 15 when I met him. And on the surface, once again, he should be there. Um, but when you peel back the onion, what he didn't have is a father at home that says, Dad, hey, I've seen this girl on the street, she needs some help. Or a pastor to go to, or a coach to go to, or anybody in his life that he can reach out to, to come and give assistance. And so he thought what <laughs> he would do would made sense to him at the time. And uh, of course, he used the logic that all young men use when they do stupid things. It felt like a good idea at the time, right? <laughs> of course it wasn't, uh, and it ended up ending him up in, in prison. But from a societal perspective, you're right. Like, hey, here's, here's someone that did the wrong thing um, for the right reasons. And so we need to, to come around him as a community. Uh, there is one more gentleman that I'd like for you to hear from today that has uh, got a very uh, diverse uh, background uh, in, in, in law enforcement. And we're coming law enforcement pretty heavy before we bring in the rest of the part. Yeah, you guys that are online can't see this, but uh, I, I've been joking with the law enforcement that we have here today that I feel like the safest man in America. Like, there, <laughs> there's no one that's going to come in here and do anything wrong today. I, I feel very well. I feel like the president today. It's like, oh, I, we got an entourage. It's all good. Um, but uh, uh, Mr. Um, Officer Foy, if you can come and just uh, just give these people some a piece of your heart, I appreciate it. I'm Deputy Foy. I work for the Tarrant County Constable's Office here in Arlington. Constable Robert McGinty is my boss. Uh, I've worked in the criminal justice system for 30 years. I've been a peace officer for 26 years. I grew up in Huntsville, Texas. Mm. For a lot of people that are familiar with Huntsville, Texas, like most people that graduate from high school in Huntsville, Texas, I graduated high school and went to work at the prison. That's the number one employer in Huntsville in Walker County is TDCJ. 19 years old, green as the grass outside. Okay, here you are. This is a cell block with 170 convicted felons on it. Here's your keys. Thank you, have a nice day. Wow, wow. Yeah. And what I learned working around these folks for 12 and a half years. I was a correctional officer for four and a half years, a sergeant for five and a half years, and worked as an internal affairs investigator for two and a half years, is talking about the family, getting back to kind of what we're talking about today, what we touched on today. Unstable home life doesn't begin to describe what most convicted felons have in their lives. When you look at their records and you see that they were smoking marijuana at eight, cocaine at 11, crystal meth, heroin at 13. You look at their visitor list. Every inmate in Texas prisons has 10 people that they can put on their visiting list that are, you know, investigated, vetted, et cetera, for visitation on the weekends. Seven of those 10 people are incarcerated. They're in other prisons themselves. Uh, no parental figures to speak of, usually no father figures, no mother figures. And the most telling thing for me, especially when I started there, is profanity. That's the only thing they understand. And a lot of times, you know, when you're working that cell block or trying to maintain order in a maximum security prison, you say, inmate, go ahead and mop that floor. And he would look at you like you were speaking a foreign language. And then you would have to put certain flavoring words <laughs> into those orders. And then he would immediately grab that mop and start mopping the floor. Because growing up, that's all he heard. That's, that was his vocabulary was, you know, the various words that most parental units teach their children not to say. So later, as I transitioned from a correctional officer to a peace officer, uh, I spent a bulk of my career working full-time at TDCJ and then reserving with different agencies as a deputy constable, deputy sheriff, and a municipal police officer. Um, I took that with me when you're out in the community, when you're dealing with people in the community. You have to realize that not everybody had that Brady Bunch, leave it to Beaver type upbringing. And I tried to make it a point 
not to use profanity, not to put flavoring words in the thing, stuff like that, because they heard that all the time. And kind of like we were talking about before the broadcast, talking about that 17-year-old that wore a suit for the first time. When you talk to somebody and they're not hearing all of those words for the first time, it's like, wow, that's amazing. So that's probably the number one thing that has helped me as a peace officer dealing with the community, that community-oriented policing aspect is if you'll talk to people with care and compassion and that kind of thing, you'll get that care and compassion back. And that's the number one thing I would say here in the broadcast, the number one thing I would say to everybody here and everybody I come in contact with is if you spread that good word, then you'll get that good in return. And that's my message today. And thank you all for listening. <laughs> You know, I, I've got a question for everybody in here. And, well, everyone but one person in here. Uh, and my question is, do you remember where you were Tuesday morning on September 11th? Now, of course, he would not remember. <laughs> Lauren, you remember where you were? Oh, that's right. You're pretty young. You may not. Yeah, you, I was like two. You look like you were a little toddler trying to figure yeah. out this walk-in thing. Yeah. I was at daycare. You know, it's at daycare. <laughs> Shut the daycare down. Yeah. Chief, you remember where you were? Yes. Actually, I uh, just came off midnight shift. Um, I was working for the county. Came off midnight shift. Uh, did what I normally do. And it's a little bit different for me because my work, my wife, she worked down the Mm. So um, my story is a little different. Um, so I did what I normally do. I come home, walk midnight shift, take my daughter to school, and then go get a little nap. Um, my wife and I knew, well, we had conversations. You know, when I got off work midnight shift, you don't really need to call me unless something is seriously going on until one o'clock. Right. Uh, she called me at nine. <laughs> you know, but anyway, she called me right after it happened um, and said, hey, are you, do you watch the TV? No, I'm not watching TV, I'm sleeping. So she said, no, you got to get up and watch TV. Go, go turn the TV on. And that's when the second plane hit. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's what my, you know, and think about this now. And I, and I talked about this on 9-11. Um, think about this, as an officer, we are trained to run to danger, we are trained to help people out. Uh, but that morning, uh, it was kind of helpless for me. My wife is in DC, um, you know, if you think about it, uh, the phone systems pretty much shut down because everybody was calling in, uh, so, so there was no interaction, no communication. And at the time, she was working um, for the White House. Mm -hmm. So she was very close in mm -hmm. that proximity. So like I said, so it's pers personal, it was personal for me, so I couldn't really get in contact with her. I couldn't really have any conversation. Um, but probably like later on in the day, she had called me up when the, they started fixing the system and all that stuff, and told me she was all right. But she was stuck down in DC because there were no trains in. Uh, there was there, the whole, I would say old Washington was shut down. Um, there was no trains in, no traffic coming in, no nothing, um, and nobody's getting up. Mm -hmm. So it's so she spent a good time down down in DC. Uh, she didn't get home. Matter, think about this. She leaves, leave, left to go to work at six o'clock in the morning, and she didn't get home until eleven o'clock that night. Mm -hmm. So that's what you asked me. I, I remember the birthday. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. You know, I was, I had just moved from there. Um, and so that was kind of how I knew I was like checking email and some friends of mine from there, you know, one of them was like, hey, a plane just hit the Pentagon. Like I had just been to the Pentagon not too long, like, like maybe like a few months before then. And I was like, what? And so that's when I went and turned on the TV and, you know, saw what everything else. And it was a trip because I was supposed to start a job that morning. And the day before, it's like, oh, it's going to be a week, a week later. And I was bummed out. It's like, I need to work, you know. 
And then that happened, and of course, priorities change. Um, Ms. Harriet. Uh, I was at a breakfast meeting in downtown Dallas, and uh, somebody got the phone call, and then we all scampered around to find uh, television. It was a, a meeting in a hotel downtown, so we found one. Uh, I started calling my family to be sure and had them watching, and I had a, a board meeting. I was on a college board, and our board meeting was that day. The rest of the day was crazy because board members had flown in from all over, all over the country to come to the board meeting. We, of course, canceled uh, all our agenda, and, but it, it was a matter of how to get those board members back home. And, and we couldn't get them back home. And one of them was uh, president of a college in, in uh, Florida, and we, we rented a car, and he drove the car and had to have his, his assistant to him in, in, in Florida drive that car back because you couldn't technically, te we broke the law is what we clearly did. Let's not say that around all these police officers. Yeah, yeah he's right. <laughs> technically, we weren't supposed to, he wasn't supposed to take that car out of Dallas. But he drove the car to Florida and had his staff person drive it back, and, and all of it was done nonstop. Never, he drove straight through to King's College because he wanted to be with his students. Yeah. Everybody wanted to be with whoever they were responsible for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was a matter of trying to get a whole board to where they needed to be to take care of the folks they cared about. The other interesting thing about it, I remember exactly where I was when I heard the first airplane. Mm -hmm. Remember it was days later, and, and we're accustomed, we don't even hear airplanes when they go over, we, we don't hear them. But when you didn't hear them for, what was it, was it a week? How long was it before we had flights again? It was about a week. Four days. I remember hearing the first airplane in, in the air and thinking um, there's some normality now, but but to go a week without hearing an airplane was uh, a strange phenomenon. Yeah, and think about it, like all my friends in aviation, like, so it was crazy. Everything was just, and you said something is, uh, you know, we all know intuitively, but I've never heard anybody express it. You wanted to be with people that you're responsible for, that's right. right? And that's exactly what I did. You know, I had my wife with me, I had my two girls, and I just brought him in the room, and I'm like, I'm just so glad we're all here together. All right. You know, what's your name, I'm sorry? My name is Tim Bedford. Tim Bedford. Tim, Tim, Tim Bedford was my uh, chief of staff when I served in the legislature. He's visiting me here from Mexico just for a few days, and so I invited him to come with us. Ah, <laughs> it's he was so I, I was actually staff. working for Harriet when uh, uh, on 9 11 uh, here in Dallas. Normally I worked in Austin, but during the interim, we did more work here in Dallas. And um, and I was standing in my friend's living room. That's where I stayed with while I was in Dallas. It, and I was watching from the first plane, watching the planes and the discussion on Good Morning America about how far JFK was and LaGuardia. And this was just some kind of an accident. And I thought, well, I'm going to find out. And I thought, I might be late for work. And uh, my boss is having lunch in downtown Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of shapes are coming out. Laws <laughs> <laughs> broken. Yeah, <laughs> the oh, she won't know. But anyway, so yes, I remember what, it, it, it all began when that second plane hit. Yeah. We were all wondering it could be, it might be, and then suddenly we all knew. Yeah. We were on the top. I got goosebumps <laughs> just thinking about all of it right now. <laughs> yeah, me too. Right? And I, and I went ahead then after after it was figured out, and I was in a daze. I, I, I was in a, in a daze, and I got in my truck, and I drove into work, and uh, I remember details that I never remembered. I remember water coming down off the overpass going into downtown Dallas. I remember specific things all along the way, things that happened to me every day, and I never noticed. Yeah. Got, got real that day. But it all ended up with this general feeling that that uh, uh, that there was impermanence in life. I really felt vulnerable. You, you know, there was a there was a, a video game, and I can't remember the name of the video game. I used to play it all the time. 
but it actually started like it was like this war game type thing, and it always started with the Statue of Liberty being attacked, right? And you know you don't think anything of it when you're playing a video game. That's the very first thing I thought about yeah. um, when it happened. And and so we look at that. We look at 9/11. Um, we can look across the world. You can see when uh, the, the Paris attack came or the, the down south came, even Columbine, right? H horrible situation. Um, to, to bring it all the way down here to, to locally to us, um, I don't know if, you, uh, if all of you had a chance to see it, but like a, a few weeks ago, um, a lot of kids were fighting uh, at Six Flags. Um, the ironic thing is, and I, what was it, like 100 kids? fighting in Six Flags, a lot of kids, okay? The ironic thing is around the same time, that happened in several other places. The Six Flags in, in uh, North uh, California, about 100 kids. In. The Six Flags over um, right outside of, Amer uh, yeah, uh, Prince George's County, right? All, like the same week, this is happening, right? Um, and then, of course, we see uh, what happened in our own city that has made national news now just a couple of days ago uh, where a young man shot another young man and a couple of other people uh, at school. And all of these things are related in a couple of different ways. And we're going to talk about one particular way today. Whether it's a, a terrorist attack here on our grounds, um, whether it is a, a school shooting, um, whether it is disturbances at the mall, if you look at them, there is one thing that seems to be congruent in all of them. Uh, at the core, at the very core of them, is an out of control male. And, and when you think about the, the lives that can be affected by an out of control male, it's humongous. Um, Arlington is a great city. We're, we're right next to Fort Worth. Uh, we got a couple of Fort Worthians in here. You know, I'm from Fort Worth. And there was a case in Fort Worth a few years ago where a gentleman, a, a young man, uh, got intoxicated um, and got behind the wheel of a vehicle and hurt a lot of people. He killed four people. Um, and um, his defense was that he was so wealthy that it's impossible for him to truly understand the ramifications of his actions. And they put a name to it, and they call it affluenza. Do y'all remember that case? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, he, and it worked. <laughs> it actually worked. Uh, but, but here's a young man that has altered the family trees of a lot of people, a lot of families, negatively, forever. If we look at what just happened this week, there are some family trees that will be altered here with families in the Metroplex forever. We here at Gentleman Society, we handle the problem of the out of control male. And we help to create healthy, productive members of society. We do that by concentrating on young men between eight and 18 and training them specifically and systematically how to become gentlemen. I want to direct your uh, attention to this, to this uh, thing real quick. I want to show you a little video. It just kind of introduces the program. If you can take that off of me. There's 168 hours in a week. We have one hour to affect that other 167. You got one. In, in the place that we're sitting now in, in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, in the area that we're sitting is, is probably one of the worst places to live in Fort Worth. There are kids who are dealing drugs. There are kids who are in gangs. We're talking an elementary school. We're not talking a high school. We're talking when they should be playing with blocks and uh, G.I. Joe men. There is no innocence by the time they reach kindergarten. Guns, gambling, jacking cars, stealing, robbing, and killing. Gang members and people running around with guns. Some people have to be li living on the streets and living in shacks. I was a youth pastor with the church, and I looked around and we had all of these programs for young ladies. We literally didn't have 
a lick of programming for our young men. I sat down and began writing the Curriculum for Gentleman Society. I am a gentleman. I have honor. I do honor, but things. I have integrity. I do the right thing when no one's looking. I have respect for myself and others. I value my education. I am a gentleman. How many of y'all want to be great fathers? Great fathers. Great fathers. Now, keep your hands up for a second. Okay. You know, one of the things that they're taught in gentleman society is that this is your brother. You don't say things bad about him. You don't do things bad to him. When you walk out of this door, there's enough people that want to do bad things to both of you guys. I'm going to tell you something that I don't tell a whole lot of people. I'm going to tell you why I was so scared. I had never seen a good marriage. I have a, a picture of a kid, he's about a, a fifth grader, showing a fourth grader how to tie a tie, which may not mean anything to you, but maybe about a month or so prior, both of those kids were expelled from school for fighting each other. And I didn't, I didn't ask that they help each other, I just happened to turn around and see them helping each other. Y'all learned how to treat a lady, yeah. right? Give me something about how to treat a lady. How do we treat a lady? Show them respect without talking back. Now, what types of ladies are we respecting? It's like we're talking teachers, mamas. What are we talking about? Your mom, okay. Your daddy, your niece. Check this out. One day, this is going to mess you up a little bit. One day, you're going to have a granddaughter. When they stepped out the door today, they seen drug dealers. They seen pimps on the street. They seen crackheads on the street. They seen people being cussed out. Since they've been here an hour ago, I guarantee you they've seen all of that. What they're not seeing is people saying, I love you, I care about you. I know that you can make it. I know that you can do it. I know you can do it. I know you can be that doctor. I'm gonna, I know you can be in business. I'll be your first investor. They're not hearing that. But the drug dealer is on his game because he recognizes the same thing we would all recognize in that kid. Here's a young entrepreneur. One of the best young entrepreneurs I ever met in my life was here in this school. I said, we, we have to reach him now because if I see this, the drug dealers see this too. And they're gonna come down, they're gonna find him too. I got one hour to keep them from finding him. I got one, that's it, that's all I got. If you're going to build a house, we're going to need blueprints. If you're going to build an off the hook life, you need those same blueprints. If you don't have them already, you need to go and get them, okay? Now what's gonna stop you from getting it? So you gonna let bad people stop you from your nope, destiny? Nope, nope. What's gonna stop you? Nobody. Okay. I'm just, what? Nobody. What? Nobody. Huh? Nobody. Stand to your feet. It helped me not get in trouble in class. The best thing I learned how to treat a lady and how you want your kids to grow up. If we do it right, then we'll work ourselves out of a job because we'll have a society of gentlemen, and we won't need gentlemen society. That's the goal. All right, so we're going to take questions in just a moment, but I want to explain to you kind of what the program is about, what we'll be doing here in Arlington, and I also want you to hear from our North Texas Regional Director here as well. Um, for those that don't know, for those that are watching, my name is Pastor Dwayne Washington. I'm the founder and executive director of the Gentleman Society. Um, we started the actual program about uh, 18 years ago now, um, starting right here in the Metroplex. We started with uh, four kids in what used to be Butler Housing. And uh, Butler Housing is actually being shut down right now, but that was a housing project in Fort Worth. Uh, three of those kids uh, had to leave the program for, you know, because they moved away. And so our first program started with one kid, uh, but that one kid went to college. Uh, that one kid came back and worked on my mayoral campaign. Uh, as a matter of fact, I heard him, I overheard him talking to somebody else. He said, Pastor Washington took me to my very first city council meeting. Uh, and here I am now being able to work on a mayoral campaign. So um, needless to say, it, it works. Now since that one kid, uh, we've now taught in 23 states here in America and 10 countries across the world. Um, our newest country just came on board this, uh, this year, Romania. Uh, so everything is being translated into Romanian. Uh, when I take a look at it and, uh, and try to read it, uh, 
it, it does, does not work. Uh, I speak a lot of language, but languages, but uh, Romanian is not one, as well as there's a gypsy language that they have translated into as well. So I just got to hope they're saying the right thing uh, when, when they're teaching those kids. Um, so let me just kind of explain what the program is. Like I said before, we take young men between 8 and 18. We train them systematically how to become gentlemen. We do that through 23 different courses, everything from speech and communication, anger management, how to treat a lady, behavior modification, dressing for the occasion. You see how good those kids look on that? Um, you know, it, didn't, that, didn't that just warm your heart to see that? Um, I promise you it probably wouldn't warm your heart to see how we teach that. Um, that particular school uh, just so happened the day they wanted the film, we, that particular the day we were at that school, uh, every Thursday I think it was. Um, that school was in the middle of those projects. They didn't even leave the projects to go to school. And so these are people, kids who uh, never met dad. Um, a lot of them, mom was you know, in, in some very interesting situations. And so their family life, um, as, as uh, uh, Constable uh, Foy is pointing out, um, what, what is your official title? Deputy Constable. Deputy Constable. I, I'm sorry, I don't want to mess that up. But Deputy Constable was, was pointing out that um, the, their, their home life was um, not to be desired, let's just say that. And we're talking with these kids, and it's not that we dress the kids up, because that's the, that's the physical thing that people see. Um, we, also, we, we usually don't allow cameras in until after they've been through the dressing for the occasion course. That's the course where they learn how the difference between black tie, white tie, business, and business casual. And after that time, they're required to always come in business attire, um, which is suit and tie. Uh, the only thing is that unless those kids are in prison, we don't supply those suits and ties, um, which means that you've got to look at, in this case, third and fourth graders and say, you got to figure out a way to come in a suit and tie from now on out, right? And, and once again, the way we have to, you know, back to uh, one of you gentlemen were saying, sometimes you got to talk to them in the way they understand. Uh, so with those kids, we, we have, we put it in crackhead terms, okay? So we say, uh, we will say, what, what excuse does a crackhead use to not get high? And they will say, well, there is no excuse. I said, well then, you shouldn't have any either. Because I never heard a crackhead say, I would get high, but I'm broke. <laughs> yeah, I would get high, but you know, the, the crack house is way on the other side of town. I said, a crackhead will steal your car, sell it back to you, bum a ride, and ask $20 when he gets there to go in and buy the crack, and I need a ride back as well, right? It doesn't, I would get high, but it's raining. Right? None of these are excuses that a crackhead would use, so none of them are any that you can use. And you've got an entire world on your side willing to help you, and not a lot of people are willing to help the crackhead. You know, you can go to your local police officer and say, hey, I would like to work to be able to earn some money to buy a suit. However, you couldn't go to the local police officer and say, look, I'd like to work because I need to buy some crack. Okay? So a lot of people are on your side. You've got to be able to utilize that. And the net result is that every single week they show up in suit. Ty, give those gentlemen a hand. Yeah. <laughs> I'll admit, doesn't look too pretty when we're teaching it, though, just to let you know. But the, but the end result is great. And so not that they're dressing up, they're coming in business attire, so they understand that. So all of these different courses, fine dining, they get a chance to go out to a five-star restaurant after they've been taught what fork to eat with and how to control the waiter with their napkin. Um, you name it. Um, pretty much everything you would teach your son before he's 18. Uh, entrepreneurship. I remember one time, uh, one of the, one group of kids were going out to meet a particular entrepreneur, and they had been, you know, they all have to start businesses, and they had been taken to this gentleman, and I knew the gentleman was well off. I just didn't know how well off he was, and so he shared his financials and everything with us. This is the gentleman who made just short of four hundred million dollars a year, okay, and he shared his personal cell phone number with all of these kids. And he said, I've given you some advice on what to do to be able to start your businesses and, and, and how to get it done. I want you to do those things. And once you get those things done, give me a call back. I'll be your first investor. That's incredible. The type of access that you're able to get. And that's the type of thing that begins to change people's minds, their ideas, and hold on. There, 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 is, a, uh, there is a statement that I used to make that 
you know, if a kid was on his way to community college, he might be on his way to Harvard when he comes through Gentleman Society. If he was on his way to prison, then he might be on his way to community college. You know, we'll bump you up one. Um, but we've seen some phenomenal change. I was actually writing a book on one gentleman who uh, has started gang banging around nine. Um, and he came through the program, changed his whole life, and then he got accepted to Harvard. So I was writing a book from hustling to Harvard, right? <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, and then he came back, he said, Pastor Washington, I changed my mind. Um, I think I want to go to a and I'm like, that doesn't have the same alliteration, you know, <laughs> hustling to A&M. And, and, and to your point, we talked about language. There's a whole study of the dictionary that goes along with Gentleman Society. So they're bringing new words every week to be able to uh, increase the vocabulary because you cannot increase your thinking without increasing your vocabulary. And, and the, I said, well, why, you know, why, why a and I'm a you know, I don't want, I want to bash a and a and is a great school. Um, like, why a and versus Harvard? And he used our own logic because we say, hey, if you're going to a school, you need to visit it first and you need to have reasons to go. And he said, well, I went and visited. He said, it's cold in Massachusetts. <laughs> he said, I'm from Texas. It's cold there. I want to go somewhere warmer. Um, and, and that's exactly what he did. And so we've taught now, like I said, in 23 states and 10 countries across the world. We're doing something that we haven't done in a while. And, and that is we're targeting some areas here in Arlington. Um, because of some, some things that our program is, is involved in, we get calls from all over the nation and all over the world constantly to be able to bring the program to their area. Um, so we haven't really concentrated on bringing something because we're just responding to that demand all over the place. Um, but we're doing something different right here in Arlington. Um, we're starting 10 sites um, right here in Arlington. Most of those will be concentrated on the east side, and we'll get you more information about that. But 10 sites right here in Arlington specifically um, to target this area and their young men um, so that we can help lift together. Um, me and, and, and the chief and have had conversations about this, and I've talked to a lot of chiefs about this and even mayors about it. Uh, a lot of times when, when cities see crime go up, what do y'all think a city usually does when crime goes up? Say it again. Y'all say it out of your voice. I don't want to say it too loud because there's a bunch of them here. I'm just, you know, they're right behind me. You're right. They hire more police officers. Okay. Let's let's start. Let's pick on Fort Worth for example. Okay. Over half of the operating budget there, over 460 million dollars a year, goes towards police and fire. Over half. Right. Arlington is the same way. Over half of our operating budget goes towards police. Right now. Now, I, I, love, I love good police. Now, y'all, you know, I love good police. We, we got a good police here today, right? Amen? Right. Yeah, right. Now, them other jokers, you know. I love good police. Um, but that's not, that's just not the answer. That's not even fair to police officers. Because police don't stop crime. They respond to the crime that happens, right? It's a community issue to get people in a mindset to not commit the crime to begin with. The little boy I talked about earlier, they got locked up around 14. It was the police's job to arrest him after he already robbed a 7-Eleven. They don't have a choice. You robbed a 7-Eleven at gunpoint. That's what's supposed to happen. But what should have happened prior to that is that he have a community to come around him so that he didn't have to go rob somebody. So we're able to help the people that he's trying to help. That's our job. That's not the police's job. Making it the police's job is unfair to the police and will cause an expense that most cities can't bear. If that was to work, then New York City would be the safest place on earth. They spent over $10 billion with a B on the police, right? You're not going to solve that problem through law enforcement. You're making the problem worse and you're making it harder for our law enforcement, right? So we don't want to do that. We want to be able to solve that from, from a systematic social perspective to make it easier for all parties involved, thus preventing the crime from even happening to begin with. Um, now, before I go further and take any questions, we do have our regional director uh, for North Texas here, uh, Minister Thompson is here. Come up and say a few words. Sir. So I heard a lot of stuff so far. My name is Minister Demetrius Thompson. I've been part of General Society now for about eight years. A um, couple things about me as a father, uh, I am a U.S. Army veteran. I have two daughters. 
uh, I got involved in this program specifically because I wanted my daughters to be able to see that we are creating healthy and productive gentlemen to select. Um, Gentlemen's Society has been positive in every area. I've been out in Forest Hill, uh, over here in Saginaw, Texas. Um, we have been able to change the family tree for young men. Um, I have seen eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, 15-year-olds change their direction. And it is because we are lifting their self-image. Our job is to lift the self-image of our young men, especially our African-American young men. Um, those that don't have a dad, we, we are their dad. We are the one who is speaking into them. We are the ones who are lifting them up. We are the ones who are holding them accountable. Gentlemen's Society is, is a solution. Um, that's the solution that we are seeking to provide to every community. Arlington, Fort Worth, uh, Garland, Duncanville, Dallas, all over Texas, because it's needed. That's the first thing we need to do is create that foundation. Uh, Officer Reeves, he pointed out family unit. Um, when we think about family unit, family is who you get in your corner, not who you were born to. When we think about some of the things that Chief Jones said, he said transparency, open and honest dialogue. Well, that open and honest dialogue, it has to take place inside of a private room for us to have face-to-face -face interaction, eyeball to eyeball, with young men that are nine years old, and we have to mentor them instead of the drug dealers. We have to mentor them instead of someone else's grandma. And I'm not putting grandmas down, but I, what I am saying from a male perspective, males need another male they can look up to. I'm an entrepreneur. I work for the government. I've served my country. What does success look like? You're looking at it. So now can you do it? Yes, I'm from the hood, from Oklahoma. Did I arrive here easily? No. Did it take work? Yes. Can you do it? Yes. Should something stop you like the video said? Will anybody stop you from your destiny? No. So let's go. We have to positively impact change through changing the mindsets of young people. Um, I heard, um, I think, um, Chief Jones, and he said something that was really awesome. He said respect and communication, engaging citizens. Those are my citizens. My nine years old, they're citizens. They're my future. They're my future of social media. They're my future of what's gonna take place. So why can't I start getting their attention now? I need their attention right now because I don't need to walk down the street and think that I need to be afraid. No, no, I need to walk down the street and if I need some help, they need to help me cross the, to the crosswalk, right? Because our job is to serve them first. When we serve our young people first, our young people have no problem serving us. Our young people have no problem respecting us. So just think about a couple of things. I heard about, I heard profanity, I heard language. Gentlemen society, we do not solicit any form of profanity. We do not solicit uh, four letter words. Matter of fact, if you bring me a dictionary word that's a four letter word, I'm sorry, that word is no longer valid. We need another word. I try validation. You're eight years old, I want you to spell it, I want you to use it in a sentence, I want you to provide it to me the way that you would in the English class. Subject, predicate, we want it all, right? When we expect great things from young people, we get great results. When we don't expect great things, when we don't impart and take the time to train up a child in the way they should go, when they get older, they don't know which way to go. They don't know how to respond to authority. But when they're seeing authority right in front of them, one time a week, Pastor Washington gave us the opportunity, gave me the opportunity to stand in front of gentlemen, teaching GS1, 2, and gold. Having an opportunity to do so changed the paths of people in Saginaw, Texas. Every time one of those young men, they see me, they say, hey, how you doing, Minister Thompson? Hey, I'm doing well. I just finished my master's degree. That's what I want to hear. Those are the types of effects that I've been able to hear in eight years. I've been able to see young men become husbands, become fathers, taxpayers, entrepreneurs. I know it works. He did this and created this 20 years ago. I've only been doing it for eight, but I'm here to tell you that Gentleman Society is a solution. 
we're all looking for what the solution is, it's not hiring more police. It's all about being able to lay down positive self-image, lay down the understanding of what does respect look like, what does honor look like, what does integrity look like. How do you value your education when you don't take time to digest it? We have to put people in front of these young people, these young men, so that they may have a new family. It's not the gang, it's gentleman society. We are the real OG. If you want to know who the real OG is, we are the real OG. It's important we, we talk their language. It's important they know that we came from some place. We have to be transparent in how we grew up. So I, I want you to really understand everything we do is not for us. It's for someone else. Just like our officers in the room, everything you do, it's not for you. It's for my family. It's for my community. Well, guess what? I have to be able to go and serve my young population before someone else gets their attention. So for those of you listening online, Gentleman Society is here as a solution. We are here to provide a solution. The issues we have now is how many mentors can we get? That's all I have. You know, as, as, as Minister Thompson was talking, he's all about business, you can tell. It's, so I'm telling you, he, he keeps things under wrap. Uh, I was, I was re remembering some things, because there, there's some unspoken things that we have in gentleman society. The guy who is over the sites, we call those an LC, or a life consultant. And that life consultant is like a father. And a lot of times the, the mom and, and the schools will utilize them as such. So for example, if a kid messes up at school, it's highly likely that LC is showing up. Um, and everybody likes to see the LC show up, except for the kid. Uh, I remember there was a, there was a, cause I still teach it as well, and there was a kid, um, he, he decided to do some, some stupid stuff and ended up in a, and I, I, don't, I don't know the, the politically correct term to use here, so I'm gonna skip the term, but he ended up in, in a facility uh, outside of Austin, Texas. And he looked up one day and I walked through, uh, through the door. And this is a you know, highly secure facility. And, and his, his eyes just went crazy. He was like, how in the world, number one, did you find me here? Number two, did you get in here? I'm like, that is the least of your worries <laughs> right about now. Because you know? <laughs> I drove four hours for us to have this conversation that we're getting ready to have. You, know? you, you better be glad they have uh, cameras around here so, so you leave out of here walking. Um, but but that young man was able to, not, and I told him, I said, now you tell me if this is the life that you want, right? If this is what you're picking, if this is what you want, you, you let me know, right? Because you can stay right here. Um, long story short, that young man turned his whole life around. Uh, and we've seen plenty of that just from that, uh, as, as the officer said earlier, we've all made some mistakes. Throw both of my hands in the air. We've all made some mistakes. Um, but um, as you said before, you had that father say, hey, look, son, <laughs> we, we are, well, for those that had that, hey, look, son, uh, that changes a, 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 whole, a whole family tree. And so for those boys that don't have the dad to say, hey, look, son, you know, we have to step in and say, hey, look, boy, mm -hmm. you cut that out. And knowing that, um, we've shown up and, and sat inside of detention, uh, detention halls with that kid just to let them know. You mess up, we're showing up. There, there is uh, accountability, right, um, associated with all the things that you do, and whatever you do is not just affecting you, it's affecting everybody else. I remember when I was still working in corporate America, and I'll take some questions in just a second, but there, there was a gentleman, actually he was, uh, he wasn't, he was in Scott's site, um, but he had been kicked out of school for not wearing a belt. And so his mom called me and said, hey, you know, he's been kicked out of school. I said, real easy. I said, bring him to me today. He's going to spend the day with me at my office, right? And I had told all the people in my office, you know, what, what had went on the whole night. And so he came to my office. He was sitting there. And he said, Pastor Washington, don't you think it's dumb that I got kicked out of school for not wearing a belt? I said, man, you know what? That's the second dumbest thing I've ever heard is for some kid to get kicked out of school for not wearing a belt. He said, the second. I said, it's the second. 
I said the, first, the dumbest thing is to not wear a belt, <laughs> knowing you're going to get kicked out of school for not wearing it. So probably every 15 to 20 minutes, you know, uh, one of my guys would step in the office and flash his belt. <laughs> Mr. Washington, I got my belt on today. Just want to let you know. And, and let me tell you, after eight hours of that, yeah, we didn't have to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, he, he knew how to be in dress code when he was at school. And, and that's something that's so small, right, but could have turned into something very, very big over time. And so you want to be able to catch that early. So I want to pause for a second and see if we got any questions on, online or any questions here before I close it up. Yes, ma'am. I do. So, you know, I'm from Arlington. Um, Ag Town. Martin, right down the street over here. And I understand that you said your focus is going to be more so in East Arlington. Um, but, you know, we are on the west side over here. Mm -hmm. Where I went to school at, you know, there were plenty of young men that I would say could benefit from your program. So why is the focus just, I guess, in East Arlington? It's not just in East Arlington. We're doing 10 sites all together, okay. right? So they'll be located throughout the, throughout the Arlington area. There is uh, uh, one or two in the south, one in the north, I think two here on the east on the west side and then the rest will be over on the east side so the majority on the east side but not 100 percent uh and let me let me kind of address this too because a lot of times we'll talk about um how many y'all heard the term at-risk kids okay you know what i consider the at-risk kid to be a kid under 18. <laughs> they're all at risk okay we, we just seen a, a gentleman shoot another gentleman that gentleman was not poor okay yeah, it, he, he, when, when they said one, one thing, there's two, two bits of information, and Lauren helped me with the, uh, I'm, uh, it was either you or, or the councilwoman, I can't remember which one, I but two bits of information I got off, off the bat, it's like, yeah, he, uh, he turned himself in with his attorney. Okay, hood kids. <laughs> that was number one. Number two is that he drove off in a, in a 2018 uh, 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 Charger. That was number two. <laughs> <laughs> that was number two. It's like, oh, okay. Well, uh, he's 18 years old. He got a 2018 Charger. Now, I'm from the hood. Let me tell you something. Unless somebody jacked that, man, they're not driving that at all. Um, but yeah, so so we're not talking about somebody that came from um, from destitute or is worried about where his next meal is coming from. Um, and I'm not. And once again, that that's a very nuanced situation. Um, but even with that, inside a gentleman society, we teach conflict resolution. Okay. We have that exact situation. We, we actually go through situations live in our courses, okay? So, so we, we go through what is, we, we will make you mad enough to fight and say, now what are you gonna do, right? But now we teach you all the stuff you need to be taught prior to that. And we say, okay, now let's utilize those skills, okay? We, we classroom teach how to be pulled over by the police. That is a classroom whole thing that we teach, right? Yeah, it's a whole role play. We have to do it twice, because the first time before they learn any skills, Somebody dies, the other one gets arrested. Never fails, right? The simulation goes the same. Yeah, it, except ex there's one place that it never goes wrong. When we run that simulation with our kids in prison, they always do perfect. It's amazing. <laughs> they get pulled over, they pull right on over. Kids on the outside want to run, do everything else, they end up getting shot and killed. So, but once we teach them that skill and how to be able to handle it, they don't have those issues again. Um, we don't get calls from our, our uh, ex gentleman society uh, students that you know they've gotten locked up or they was harassed by the way. We don't get those calls um, that they got kicked out of school. Or it, that we just don't because you can't unlearn something. Um, so that's answer your question. Yes, I, one more question. Sure, you can have as many as you want to. It's okay. like I got a lot. No, um, majority of your students, would you say that they're majority black or how does the percentage make up with Arlington being a majority white city? How does the percentage of your students usually make up that? Remember, we're in 10 countries, okay. right? So it's, it, it all depends on where you're it, it usually looks like wherever you are, right? So if, if the program is in Boston, it looks like Boston looks. If it's in uh, North Carolina, if it's in you know, uh, New Zealand. Like, and, and once again, the reason that I say that you know, an at-risk kid is one under 18, here in Texas, we always think about you know, specific demographics, um, but there are some demographics that are unique. It's the same issue all over the world, but there are demographics that are unique. So for example, New Zealand, they have the highest level of, of youth suicide in the world, um, mostly because they're just isolated and they don't hear the things that we're talking about in gentleman society. Um, so it, it kind of doesn't matter. It, it looks like wherever we are, 
right? So, it, it, I mean, once again, there are gypsies who are taking gentleman society right now, and the and curriculum didn't have to change. Pastor D, if I could throw this in. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the area of Saginaw, Texas, where I typically have a site location at our church, um, we have a different and diversified community that's there because of the homes that have been built and the people who have moved into the Saginaw area as it is growing. So that dynamic, uh, it could be 35% African American, and it could be 15% Caucasian. And it could be another 15% Latino. Um, but we have a lot of different diversity aspects that now tie in. And like he said, um, I was actually in um, over here in Forest Hill. Uh, in Forest Hill, we had another different dynamic that was taking place. We had grandmothers who were raising their kids. And it was all different types of mm -hmm. di diversified situations that was happening. But a lot of times, it was I, I met a lot of grandmothers who was raising their kids because their mom was unfit and there was no father. So uh, lots of different dynamics depending on where you are. But I've actually done the Forest Hill location, the Saginaw area, um, and it's just really, like he said, it's depending on where you are. I may have one out in Benbrook at some point, point in time, and I would imagine uh, probably it's going to be 80% Caucasian. So it just all depends on where you're located. At. And it depends where we're doing the site at, too. So, like, you know, if we're in a uh, – thank you very much, Chief. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, if we're in a uh, in an area, like so, if we're in a prison, for example, or in like a detention center, it just depends on the makeup of that detention center. So it just kind of depends. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Uh, Y'all check for any questions online too. Yes. What's your timeline for opening the ten sites in Arlington? We're trying to get them all done uh, and open before December first, right? So that they'll all run. Um, it's kind of weird how it run. Technically, it's a nine month thing, but it's broken up. So it'll be like four and a half months and then another four and a half months and it'll end about um, about midsummer. Can you talk about real quick, throw in orientation first? Yeah, so it'll be a, a week long orientation um, and then after that it'll start like a, um, two segments of just over four months. Make sense? Yeah. Yes, sir. A couple, uh, couple quick questions. Uh, being that I was executive director of a nonprofit uh, dealing with the uh, uh, Freedom School. Yeah. Um, how um, how are you getting your funding and uh, city helping you out on this and uh, where do you guys go about your funding? Um, so we get funded from a couple of different places and thank you for asking that. Um, we we have I sat down with the mayor uh, and, and told him I told him before, while he was running that hey after this race I'm coming for your wallet right and I, and I made good on it <laughs> and told him hey this is exactly what we need. Um, we've sat down and met with the, uh, our state rep here, uh, Tony Tenderhope, um, and also uh, Voice, this is what we need to be able to make this happen. Um, we have private people that give to us. Um, and so just, just a, a myriad of different ways. Uh, what we've done in the past, it, it's a little different than what most organizations that we deal with do. Um, we pretty much just make it happen regardless. Um, so for example, there's, there's a, there's a direct cost to each one of these kids that we'll be dealing with. Like, it's a hard cost that it's going to cost me. And um, we, we will, regardless of if we raise that amount or not, we will still go ahead and have that program fully, um, regardless. So prayerfully, we'll be able to raise that. Uh, if not, you know, my pockets may be a little lighter, but we'll still make sure the program goes forward. Second question is, uh, is there any... And it is a 501c3. Yeah. Is there any component to the program that is a parent engagement? I think like the Freedom School, that's a key component, is a parent engagement that once a week would have the parents come in as well yeah. uh, to engage them and also update them and let them know um, how that child is progressing or the, the issue. Of course, you know, we, classroom is one thing, but then they go home. Yeah. And every time you see them, you got to retrain them. So it's interesting that you say that. Originally, when we started the program, there was no parent involvement at all because we were starting with people whose parents were on crack. Like, we could not expect any type of involvement at all. And for years, we operated from that perspective, expecting that um, there is nothing good going to happen at the house. Like, you hear me say, you know, we have a, a 168 hours in a week, and we've got one hour to affect the other 167. And that was coming from the perspective of there will be zero um, assistance with what we do. 
In the past couple of years, we actually have developed something that um, will go out automatically to all of those people who have signed up. So as they go through the course, then what they, uh, the, the parent or guardian actually gets that information from a, from a different perspective, like from a here's how you help perspective. And, and we have to explain it that way because, uh, for example, um, let me see, let me see. Yes, sir. So let me give you an example. Um, one of the things that we frequently hear from our young men, who's, they say these words, my mom says I'm just like my dad. Well, we as LCs, right, as an LC, when I'm teaching and training our LCs here in Texas, we have to teach our LC how to have um, transparent moments that are correct. So we have a conversation. And I say, hey, you know what, uh, Mr. and Ms. Jones, uh, one of the things we want you to do is to uplift your son. So when they lead Children and Gentlemen Society, we need for you to see your son as a new person. I need you to see your son as a future entrepreneur, a future doctor, a future lawyer, but not as the person that you may not care for so much. So what I need for you to do when he comes home, I need you to uplift him. And when he's supposed to take out the trash, I need you to hold him accountable to taking out the trash every night at 8 o'clock. Besides, when he's at Jonah Society, because he'll be at Jonah Society at 7 o'clock. But we have, to, we have to give them examples, and the LC creates a relationship with the parent. Therefore, we're making a call, checking in. Hey, how's Tony doing? How's he been doing? This week we discussed uh, conflict management. When we discussed it, Tony had a lot of input. How's he handling things with you? We had a Mother's Day assignment. I had some gentlemen in, in the room, uh, and we were doing uh, how to treat a lady. And Mother's Day came up, and I gave every one of my gentlemen a charge. And the charge was to show their mom that they love them without buying anything and without getting someone else to buy them something. So that means that they had to do acts of kindness. How many of us know acts of kindness go a long way? So not just for Mother's Day. It was for the entire week they were able to Im effectively impact change at their house, and I got phone calls from every mom. Yeah. So it's about the LC communication, not just the outgoing email, but LCs create a connection, not necessarily bringing them into the classroom, because they will act a little different when mom's in the room. Yeah. What we have to do is make sure that we are in the room, but we're coaching mom too from phone or text, however that works. Yeah. So back to you, guys. Yeah, and so and for us, that's you know that that parental thing. Um, I remember when the first parent actually wanted to be involved. It was so different for us. We were like, "Wait, you you want to do <laughs> like?" It was just like, "Like, what, what do we do here? You know, what 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 do you feed this person?" You know, um, and so it is. It's pretty new. Like from a systematic perspective, it's pretty new on our part. Um, it's because we just the the program was implemented um, initially with people who you cannot depend on giving good advice for, it, for anything. Um, we have seen some different parents come through since then, which is why we started the, the support on the other side. So, and some of it's really important, like for example, a kid will just come home and say, mom, they say I gotta have a suit for next Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then it's on mom, it's not on mom. Because we're gonna talk about you really bad when you show up the next week and say, well, my mama didn't take, your mama? So your mama's taking this class? So it's, it's, so it's your mama's fault. Because we teach them like, everything is your fault, dude. You got to handle that, right? And if it's your fault, then you have the ability to be able to fix it and affect change, period, right? And so that's on you to do, not your mother, right? Don't put, she got enough burden on it. You figure that out, right? Um, so, but yeah, there's a small component of it, but I wouldn't say um, it's not, not this huge teaching component yet. You, you had, did you have a question? No. Okay. Any other questions? We got about four or five minutes left. You look like you got a question. Yeah. Okay. What kind of things do kids do to get a suit coming from those means? Well, so so I'll, I'll flip it. What kind of things would would somebody do to get something like some Jordans? They would get a job. Yeah, they they'd figure it out. Make some money. Right. They're ten. They're ten. What do they do? So yeah, let's just let's, let's say they're ten. Okay. Let's say you own a, a suit a suit a suit shop, and a ten year old comes to you and says. I'm in this program called Gentleman Society, and it is a requirement that I show up with a suit every single week. The issue is I'm 10, right? And I can't make anybody do anything. I don't have a car, right? I don't have a dad, right? But what I can do is I can work. I can sweep up some stuff. 
right? You allow me to sweep up some things, do a few things for you, cut a yard, rake some leaves or whatever, and you give me a suit, can we have that deal? What would you say to him? Right. Okay. But, but, it, but it's teaching them to, to use what they have, right, to get the things that they want. Use what you have. Um, because especially if you have a kid coming from no means, believe it or not, they're used to people giving them things, and that's not developing that muscle that we need you to develop, right? We need you to develop that muscle. You gotta do something, right? You gotta go out and you gotta make it happen. And, and if you don't make it happen, that's your fault. It's not the world's fault, right? It's your fault. And when, like, like Minister Thompson was saying, usually when you have those expectations, they live up to those expectations. There's a school in, in, uh, in Chicago, I believe it is, where, um, and we teach this in Gentleman's Society, there's a peer pressure course, right? But it's taught on the reverse, and let me explain it. So the school in Chicago, um, ever since they've been open, it's an all boys school in the inner city. Ever since the day they've been open, they had 100% graduation rate and 100% acceptance to four-year college wow. without a miss, okay? So imagine you're in the fifth class, the fifth graduating class of this school. It's December, and also they wear suit and tie every day. They wear a red tie, except for when they get accepted to a college and they change that to a red and gold tie. It's, it's a striped tie. So, so it's a, it is a physical manifestation of your ability to get accepted to a college. Now, imagine it's December. Everybody has that red and gold tie, except you. That's peer pressure, right? That's pressure. Everyone's been accepted to two and three, some, some even four, four-year colleges, and you are the lagging one. And mind you, every class before you, 100% of them have been able to get that. Is that peer pressure? Yeah. But it's pressure to do the right thing. So when you pick your peers, peer pressure isn't bad, right? Mm -hmm. Anything else, any other questions from anybody? Was there any questions online that you see? I didn't see any. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate you so much. We're looking forward. Um, if someone's wanting to know more about the organization, you go to gentlemenssociety.org, gentlemens, plural possessive, society.org. We always talk about there's three things that you can always do. Uh, we talk about time, treasures, and talent. Treasures is real easy. You can give some money. It costs us basically $22 per week per kid. It's $1,000 a year per kid, right? So if you want to change somebody's life, there you go. Um, the other is, is with your time and your talents. And the, we definitely need as many LCs or life consultants as we can possibly get. We will train you um, so you don't have to worry about that. It's like, oh, I never taught kids before. That's okay. We just need good dudes. We will train you on how to be able to, to put out the curriculum. Um, we meet in different types of places, so this may be a space. Uh, could be a community center, library like we are here. Uh, could be we have business owners that actually donate uh, their building to us once a week for about an hour. So if that's church. you, give yeah, churches, absolutely. Yeah, you're, one of your sites was in a church. Um, yeah, the other one was in a, in a, a business. Yeah, so, so um, you know, if, if you have one of those places and you'd like to donate that to us for a few months, um, we'd love to have that as well. Uh, and then there is a ton of back office things that we need as well. So, for, for example, if you ever see a bunch of gentlemen society kids out because we have taken these gentlemen somewhere, uh, Minister Thompson, how do they roll? Limo. Always. Suits. They, they Red ties, white shirts. They in stretch Hummers, stretch Lincolns, right? That's how, that's how they go around, right? So when you see them at a city council meeting, you know, all decked out sitting on the front row, best, best believe there's a stretch Hummer out front, right? Um, and, 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 and they charge me for those. So, <laughs> so if, you, if, you, if you own a limo company <laughs> and, and would like to uh, ease the load, uh, we would love to have you. Um, but any type of services, we, we'd love to have that as well. Um, if, uh, if your name is Jim Ross uh, and you've got a whole suite level uh, down at the ballpark, you. yeah, you can uh, donate that to Gentleman Society. Jim, I told you I was coming for your pocketbook, Rob. <laughs> what kid. So if you anything like that you'd, you'd like to come and help out with, and once again, there's a lot of back office things, a lot of coordination. Uh, we, I won't take you through all of them now. You can contact me later. Um, but there's a whole list of things that, that we have areas for you to help. So if you say, I want to help, 
um, I, I, I love with her. I won't say out loud what Harriet told me, but it was so good uh, when she said, hey, can you use this? I said, yeah, we could use you all day. It's all great, right? There's a lot of different areas um, that we can utilize help in. So I want to thank you for being here today. We appreciate you for our online community. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. The, uh, the link will be there at the bottom. You can click on it, hit the contact. If you'd like to sign up your son, you can free of charge. Uh, we would love to have you do that as well. And if any one of you know some uh, young men that would like to sign up, we would love to have them. The only requirement is that they are a young man between the ages of eight and 18. Um, if, they are, if they are eight or 18 or anything in between, they qualify. So thank you very much for being here today. We appreciate you. If you can give yourselves a hand. Thank you very much. Once again, my name is Pastor Washington. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you all for being here.